Today on the Matt Wall Show, as I return from my excursion into the third world, we'll talk about the pain and suffering of people in this country, specifically those who are deeply suffering because of Joe Rogan's podcast. Really tough for them. Also, Stacey Abrams poses for a photograph which unwittingly summarizes two years of insane COVID policies all at once. And the Olympics have started, but nobody's watching. I wonder why. Plus, CNN hilariously mourns the loss of its boss after he was ousted because of the latest sex scandal at the network. And in our daily cancellation, we will deal with the NFL head coach who says that he's the victim of racism. Poor guy. We'll talk about all of that and much more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, going online without ExpressVPN... Well, it's like leaving your kids with the nearest stranger while using a restroom. Most of the time, it's probably fine, but you never truly know who you're trusting. Why would you ever risk it? That's why you need to be using ExpressVPN. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network in cafes, hotels, airports, basically any network that's not your own, your online data is not secured. Any hacker on the same network can gain access to and steal your personal data. What does that include? Well, it includes things like passwords, financial details, you name it. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that hackers can't steal your data. Just fire up the app, click one button, you're instantly protected. It's that simple. ExpressVPN works on all of your devices like laptops, phones, and tablets so you can stay secure on the go. So secure your online data today at expressvpn.com slash Walsh and get three extra months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Walsh expressvpn.com slash Walsh. So I can't say where exactly we went last week or what exactly we were doing. Those details will be revealed in due time. But I can say that this project took us to a third world African country, a very poor place, a very dangerous place. We traversed hundreds of miles, getting a, a good view of both its urban and rural environments. The one constant nearly everywhere was poverty. And not the kind of poverty we have in this country, where a person may be called poor and yet own three TVs and a cell phone and live in a multi-bedroom home subsidized by the government and be so far from starvation that they're morbidly obese. That's American poverty. It's very unique. It's not third world poverty. Third world poverty is utter and complete destitution. There are no fat poor people in the third world. There are no fat people, period. You don't see them. They don't exist. And uh, people don't own TVs, they don't have refrigerators, probably don't have electricity. You know, we saw entire families living in shacks, shacks half the size of a standard garage made out of sticks and mud and spare sheet metal. There were a lot of what you might call, uh, I don't know, third world townhomes, which were looked to be sort of shipping containers divided into five or six tiny units for five or six large families to live in. There's trash everywhere, there's sewage everywhere, everything is dirty, everything smells. The people are emaciated. The children have flies all over their faces, crawling into their ears and swarming around their eyes. Out in the country, people subsist on their herds of goats and cows, which they guide to new grazing areas by walking directly on the highway with the cows. And if they want to go all the way to the nearest town, then they might have to walk dozens of miles. And the nearest town invariably features a small butcher shop set up in a shack or old shed with ambiguous slabs of meat probably covered in maggots, hanging on hooks and spoiling in the sun. There are street vendors with paltry little stands or random items set out on blankets. And sometimes there would be a a tiny hut with a pharmacy or hotel or hospital spray painted on the side. Now, very small pockets of the very wealthiest parts of the main city did have retail outlets and other landmarks of modern civilization. We had to pass through a um, security checkpoint guarded by men in military fatigues in order to access a shopping center with restaurants that sold the kind of food that you could eat without contracting intestinal parasites, hopefully. Now, most people didn't live in those areas, though, and even if they did, they couldn't afford to buy anything from them. Most lived in the sort of poverty that you can't really understand until you see it, but which most Americans will live and die without ever seeing. Now, the other thing about third world countries is that nobody appears to be in charge. There is no system anywhere. There's no infrastructure. This is most obvious on the roads where stoplights and stop signs can rarely be found. I don't think I saw a single one. And like I said, we drove hundreds of miles. And where they are found, they're simply ignored. Everybody drives in whatever direction they feel like going. Cars, bikes, people, livestock dashed around you, in front of you. People driving on the wrong side of the road at random. 
We were warned to keep our windows rolled up whenever the car was traveling slower than a person can walk because people will just run up and reach their hand into your car and take whatever they can grab. That's the other thing about a country like this. Everybody wants to rob you everywhere all the time. And this includes the random government and security officials who you may encounter on the roads and in the cities and in the airports. You're advised to have small bills ready in your pocket to dole out bribes as need be. And a few American dollars can get you out of all sorts of jams. In fact, as we may or may not have learned, I can neither confirm nor deny, you might encounter a situation where you have to dole out a bribe as soon as your plane touches down in the airport. But you may need more than a few dollars if you happen across any of the roving bands of terrorists or criminal gangs who make a living kidnapping people, especially white Westerners, and selling them into slavery or holding them for ransom. That's the kind of thing, that's, a, that's, the, that's the real possibility you have to worry about in a country like this. We had a team of armed security to help dissuade such attempts, but most people in the country don't have that advantage, obviously. That's just one of the many threats that will seem quite unique to the visiting Westerner. There are others, like wild animal attacks. We stayed in tents for the majority of our time there. And uh, two members of our crew had their tent invaded and ripped apart by a large and aggressive male baboon. And this event was unsettling to us, but not a surprise to the locals. It's the kind of thing they have to deal with. You tell them about it, and there's like, they say, oh, yeah, those baboons are jerks. There are even more ubiquitous dangers, though, like the water, which you can't drink and probably shouldn't even bathe in unless it comes from a bottle. And even then, you can never be too short. Same goes for the food. You could probably eat uh, the meat if it's cooked thoroughly and doesn't smell spoiled, though you can never be exactly sure what sort of animal you're actually consuming. I think I ate horse once, but I'm not sure. Eat anything uncooked, including fruits and vegetables, and you risk spending the next 12 hours with violent diarrhea. And this experience will be additionally unpleasant because depending on where you find yourself when it hits, you probably won't have access to anything resembling a modern bathroom. In summation, third world countries are hell. Absolute hell. You often hear people claim that parts of LA and San Francisco and Chicago are like third world countries. And as part of this same project, by the way, we've been to all of the, 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 those cities as well. And actually, it's not far from the truth. But in, in a third world country, the whole place is like the worst part of Los Angeles. The whole country is a homeless encampment. We aren't at that point yet in our country, though the Democrat Party is trying its best to bring us there. For now, in comparison with countries like the one that we visited, that is, in comparison with most of the countries on Earth, we are living in unfathomable luxury. Most of the world is a horror show, a nightmare. We're living like kings, most of us. If you can turn on your faucet and drink the water, you're already leagues ahead of most of the people on Earth. We are comfortable to an obscene degree. Most of us don't know what suffering looks like. We haven't seen oppression, much less experienced it. We are decadent. And that has made us flimsy and weak and stupid. So it was interesting on the 30-hour trip home to get caught up on uh, the news in America. Because uh, I was a little bit out of, the, out of the loop for that week, as you might expect. Especially the biggest story, which is the effort to punish, cancel, and silence Joe Rogan. And it all began, of course, with claims that Rogan has disseminated misinformation about COVID because the people who run around claiming that men can get pregnant and that the world will end in five years because of climate change and that racist cops are hunting and murdering black people at random in the street, they're all very concerned about misinformation. But then the, the, the highly coordinated and funded campaign moved into its, its next phase, which anyone could have seen, seen coming, which has involved digging up old podcast episodes where Rogan utters the forbidden word, the N-word. A word which you might hear shouted 45 times in a pop song without complaint from anyone, but which a guy like Rogan cannot say even when simply quoting someone else. If your skin color is on the darker side of the color spectrum, you can say it in any context you like. If it's on the lighter side, you can't say it in any context at all. Now, this rule obviously makes no sense whatsoever, it cannot be justified on any rational or moral basis at all. Yet it's used nonetheless to destroy people like Rogan. Not because he said that word, but because he said a whole bunch of other things that the ruling class doesn't want anyone to say. It's all a pretense. 
This is why, as people have been pointing out, someone like Howard Stern. I mean, Howard Stern, for 30 years, every day, said things that were far more offensive than any Joe Rogan episode. Howard Stern put on blackface and said the N-word at the same time, on camera. And he's not canceled. He still has a deal with Sirius. Why is that? Well, because Howard Stern has been neutered in recent years. And, uh, and now he's convenient. He's useful to the left, especially because he's panicking over COVID all the time and pushing the vaccines. This, again, as I always remind people, um, this is not a double standard. It's not, oh, it's a double standard because uh, Howard Stern is not canceled, but, but Rogan is. No, it's one standard. And the standard is this. If you are useful to the left, you can stick around no matter who you are or what you say. If you're not, off with your head. So they want Rogan gone because of his thought crimes. They can't say that exactly. So instead they claim misinformation and they, ri they rifle through thousands of hours of podcasts to find a few examples of him saying naughty words. All the while, the left-wing mob puts on this act, pretending to be, to be somehow uh, hurt or victimized because of words uttered by a podcaster who, if they find distasteful, they could simply not listen to. But that's not good enough. The fact that he's allowed to speak at all, the fact that anyone is able to listen to him, causes them deep pain and suffering, they claim. Now, in the country that I just came from, people suffer because they live in mud huts and they drink sewage. In this country, people suffer because of podcasts. Rogan himself apologized to the mob in a six-minute video over the weekend, calling his bad language shameful and regretful and expressing, quote, deepest apologies. Who's he apologizing to exactly? Who is the aggrieved party? Who was actually hurt by this stuff that he said in podcast years ago and which nobody complained about until now? Well, that's never explained. Because by the way, another thing with all of this, um, there ought to be a statute of limitations. If you want to be offended by, some, by something that somebody says, you better be offended now. Because if they said it years ago and you weren't offended at the time, it's too late now to decide. You can't circle back around five years later and say, oh, you know what? That thing you said five years ago, I I'm actually really offended by that. I've thought about it for five years and now I'm offended. And if you didn't know that they said it five years ago, then no harm, no foul. You survived. Either way, it's too late. Of course, I say that. But I mean, if you're offended by something that someone says now, I still don't give a damn. But especially if it happened a long time ago. Too late. Meanwhile, the CEO of Spotify, Daniel Ek, sent a memo to his staff, for now, still refusing to cancel Rogan's show, mostly because it would cost him $100 million to do so, but nonetheless groveling and apologizing um, uh, for, for the things that Rogan has said. He said in part, quote, this is the, uh, the CEO, quote, there are no words I can say to adequately convey how deeply sorry I am for the way the Joe Rogan experience controversy continues to impact each of you. Not only are some of Joe Rogan's comments incredibly hurtful, I want to make clear they do not represent the values of this company. I know this situation leaves many of you feeling drained, frustrated, unheard. I deeply regret that you're carrying so much of this burden. Burden? What burden? You know, I've come from a place where, where lots of people have the burden of watching their children starve to death while their teeth rot out of their heads. Meanwhile, the employees of a multi-billion dollar media conglomerate have the burden of Joe Rogan. It's all an act put on by soulless cry bullies who are so immersed in their own privilege that they believe they have the right to control what everyone says and hears and thinks. They're so invested in this imaginary right that they believe they have been, they've been personally attacked if anyone is allowed to say anything that they don't approve of. And that's why these people do not deserve an apology. Now, I don't know Joe Rogan personally, but he seems like a nice guy and a decent guy. Unfortunately, these are not nice or decent times. You cannot be nice to the mob of spoiled brats. Their feelings are not important. Their feelings aren't even real. I doubt very much that these people are even capable of experiencing true human emotion at this point because they've been faking it for so long. When they come beating on your door demanding an apology, the best thing you can do for yourself and for the world, and even for them, is to laugh in their face. 
and then spit in it. Tell them to kiss your ass. Double down and then triple down and then double down on your triple down. What good will the apology do anyway? You may have noticed that in the whole history of cancel culture, in the whole history of public apologies offered to the cancel mob, never once has an apology been followed by the mob saying, we forgive you. Never once. Forgiveness is not on offer. They want the apology not for reconciliation, but for victory. They're demanding your submission. They want you to lie down before them so that they can stand on your face and plant their flag directly in your gut. And then claim you as a prize. Don't give these vultures that satisfaction. Spit in their face and laugh at their fake tears. It's the only way. Besides, when you apologize, you're, you're only pulling the rug out from under the people who are defending you. The very few people who had the guts to defend you, by the way. That's the other part about this. Now, I, I've had the mob coming after me enough times to know that most of your so-called friends will, will run away and hide, cowering in silence while the hyenas rip you apart. I've been through that myself. Only a few people will have the balls to stand beside you and defend you. When you apologize to the mob, you're cutting your defenders off at the kneecaps and embarrassing them. They're spending their time saying, no, 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 defending what you did. And, and, and then you come along and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm a terrible person. You hurt the people who are trying to help you and help the people who want you dead. So stop apologizing. These people are not hurt. They're not suffering. They don't know what suffering is. Life has never smacked them in the face, much to their detriment. So if you want to help them, give them the smack they need. Give them a little bit of the pain they seem to wish they could feel. That's the favor you could do for them and for the world. Now let's get to our five headlines. According to the latest research, 90% of employers plan to make enhancing the employee experience a top priority in 2022. After all, a happy workplace is key to attracting and keeping great employees. And if you need to add more employees to your team, there's ZipRecruiter. Uh, their matching technology helps you find the right people for your role for your roles very fast. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. Then it proactively presents these candidates to you. So this is a, not a passive process where you're just putting something out there. They're going to go out and find those candidates and bring them to you. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which encourages them to apply faster. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the U.S. based on G2 ratings. ZipRecruiter's technology is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So find the right employees for your workplace with ZipRecruiter.com. Uh, Try it for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh, W-A-L-S-H. All right. Um, yeah, the, this N-word thing is... It's, it's, it's one of the great absurdities of our time that everyone recognizes is totally absurd. And yet it's a rule that, that makes no sense. And yet everyone is forced to follow because the consequences are so dire if you don't. I mean, I forget which comedian. I think it might have been Bill Burr back when he was still, you know, saying things that were funny and controversial, which... These days, he doesn't seem to do quite as much. I think it was him who, who made the point a, a, a while ago that even saying, like when, when, you, when you say the N-word, you're still conveying the word. You're still communicating the word to someone because you're, you're, you, you're causing them to think it. It's the same thing with this. It's the same sort of silly thing we do as a, the F-word or the S-word. Well, there's, no real, there's no real point in dancing around it like that because you're still... If, if, if you're saying it to someone who knows what that word is, then you're causing them to think it. You're communicating it to them, right? And if they don't know what the word is and what it stands for, then there's no point in saying it because they're not going to know what you're talking about. So assuming your audience knows what the N-word is, when you say it, you're causing them to think it. You're conveying it. You're communicating it. So what exactly is the point? Especially in the context of you're trying to quote someone, let's say, which is with Joe Rogan. That's most of uh, those, those examples that they dug up. He's quoting someone. So it's, what's the difference between just saying it or saying the N-word? 
Is there some mystical, uh, supernatural significance to the syllables themselves? So you could say the N word, quote unquote, but if you, if you if you utter the actual syllables, it what does it cause people to spontaneously combust? Well, we know that's not the case because I said as as, as noted at the beginning, the people pretending to be so hurt by this, they'll listen to a song where it's shouted fifty times in three minutes. Listen to a song where it's shouted fifty times in three. But I mean, you have people who 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 listen to the word and say it hundreds of times a day. Listening to a song and it was, it's shouted 50 times. And well, it's a great song. And then they hear a clip of a podcaster quoting the word nine years ago. And they say, oh my God, that word, that word, I can't stand it. Oh, please. Oh, please. Does anyone take it seriously? Does anyone believe it? No. But Joe Rogan apologized to them. He apologized. That's why you don't apologize. All right. Um, I got to move on from this. I could keep ranting about it. Uh, I, 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 there's a lot of things. A lot of things were, were building up. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of rants kind of bottled up over the last week. And so now I've got to spill them all. Let's start with this. Uh, Stacey Abrams, who's the weird woman who uh, thinks she's governor of, of Georgia. She showed up at an elementary school last week and um, took this picture here. We got the picture there. So there she is. Um, sitting with a bunch of masked children, not wearing a mask herself. Uh, they're all, all their faces are covered, but Stacey Abrams, she has to make sure that her face is not covered because we got to see her face, right? There's only one person in that photograph who's at a high risk of COVID, and it's the obese woman sitting in the front without a mask on. But no, we got to see her face. But by the way, it's always, it, it, this is not the main point, but I, I do have to, to point out that... Uh, uh, these politicians who who are hypocrites and refuse to wear the mask while uh, making everyone else wear them, it's always the ugliest ones, too. And it's always the ones who, who you're like, well, you know, you, you should probably just wear a mask in general. But she doesn't want to wear a mask, and all the kids are wearing it. And by the way, she was there to uh, read a children's book. I think this is also worth noting. She was there to read a children's book that she wrote about herself, where she's the hero. And the, the book is called Stacy's Extraordinary Words. I'm not making that up. So she was there to read a children's book about herself as a hero. Even though this woman has never done anything significant in her entire life. Nobody can, at some point, someone named Stacey Abrams came along and the media told us, oh, this woman, she's so incredible and says so she should be president. She, and we're all asking, what, who is she? What, is, has, what has she done? Why should anyone care about her? What, what has she achieved in her life? Nothing. They just pulled her out of the blue. And she wrote this book about herself. You know, I, I tell you right now, I, I have written my own children's book, which is called Johnny the Walrus, which you can get at johnnythewalrus.com. And uh, I will quite happily go and read that to groups of children, and they don't have to wear masks. So I'll make that deal. Then the uh, campaign, the Abrams campaign, they issued a statement responding to the controversy surrounding this photo. And by the way, this photo was not, uh, it wasn't something that they, somebody dug up and put out there. It wasn't like her, her, her enemies put it out there to try to embarrass her. This is not like a Joe Rogan thing where there's a, a coordinated funded campaign to go find stuff on this guy. No, they took the picture proudly. She posed for it. They took it and she, her campaign posted it online. Because they're in such a bubble that they, they didn't even know that people would react to it the way that they did. They didn't see, I mean, before uh, a picture like that makes it online, it has, to, it, has to pat, it has to be approved by several people, including probably Stacey Abrams herself. And no one along that chain of approval said, hey, wait a second, um, you know, uh, maybe this won't look great for her not to be wearing a mask while all the kids do have to wear it. No one said, hey, wait a second. Um, the, the person in this, in this uh, photo who most needs the mask isn't wearing them, isn't wearing one, while all the people who don't need them are. Maybe we shouldn't post it. No one said that. So they posted it, and then, and then they took it down after a few hours when people reacted to it the way that um, any rational person would expect them to. And then the Abrams campaign released this statement. They said, 
It is shameful that our opponents are using a Black History Month reading event for Georgia children as the impetus for a false political attack. What's false about it? Was it, is it photoshopped? Were you wearing the mask and someone photoshopped it off of your face? What do you mean false political attack? It's not even a political attack. It's a photo that you posted. She continues, and it is pitiful and predictable that our opponents continue to look for opportunities to distract from their failed records when it comes to protecting public health during the pandemic. One of Stacey's opponents downplayed the virus while trading stock to profit off of the pandemic after his private coronavirus briefings as a center. Another of her opponents attacked mayors seeking to protect their citizens and has failed to expand access to Medicaid even as rural hospitals close. This pathetic, transparent, and silly attack is beneath anyone who claims he wants to lead Georgia. So you see, there's no apology there. Um, it's, it's racist. How dare you, during Black History Month of all things, to criticize a black woman during Black History Month. Well, this is, this is unheard of. Um, Joe Rogan and everybody else targeted by the cancel mob, you could take a lesson actually from Stacey Abrams and really any Democrat. They don't apologize. They do not apologize. They go right back on the attack. They say, no, no, no. I don't owe you an apology. You owe me an apology. And here's why. I could take a lesson from that. But really, that photo is, uh, I think it will live in infamy. And it, it because it, it summarizes two years of insane, horrible, uh, evil, twisted, perverse COVID policies. All of, all of that could really be summarized with that picture. Picture says a thousand words. And... Um, a picture of the important one sitting in a room with faceless children because their faces don't matter. And the psychological effect of having to cover their faces for years on end also doesn't matter, we're told. Now, I've seen a lot of people, by the way, sharing that photo, um, parents and, and everything, and especially parents who, who, who have their kids in schools where they still have to mask. And uh, they're sharing the photo and saying, unmask our children, unmask our children. I got to be honest with you, I'm really tired of hearing that, especially from parents who have their kids in these schools. Unmask our children. No, stop, stop, stop begging them to do it. How about you march into that school and force the issue? I mean, how have two years into this, if you're a parent, how have you not gone into the school and said, I am not leaving this building until you take that thing off my child. In fact, I'm going to take the things off, thing off my child's face, and you're not putting it back on. You touch my child, and I'm going to touch you, and you're not going to like it. How, how have the parents not done that? Two years into it, you're still, you're still uh, sitting back waiting. Please take the masks off our kids. Please, will you please? Well, they're not going to, and I'll show you why. Here's, a, um, here's the superintendent of Wake County Schools explaining why it's so important to mask, uh, especially young children. And listen to his reasoning. Here it is. Full mask compliance later down their, their growth as, as students, right? So when they're at, it's like if you're a two-year-old, you're trying to help them practice for age three and then four when they're going into pre-K classrooms. And then from there, you're trying to help them get into normalized situation, wearing masks potentially in a kindergarten classroom and so forth, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And it's, it is with a developmental lens and not a you must do this or else lens. Uh, so we gotta we gotta mask them at the age of two so that we can teach them and condition them. And he's being quite explicit about it. We gotta condition them for the future because they gotta mask now when they're two so that they wear the mask when they're three and four and five. What does that tell you? It means that he plans on those kids wearing masks forever. He's planning years into the future. They're never taking the mask off until you force the issue as a parent which means you pull your kid out of these damn places, out of these cursed places, or you show up there in the building, in the class, and you take the thing off your kid's face yourself, and you tell them you're not putting it back on. It's not going to happen. And it needs to be not just one parent doing that, but lots of parents. Say, what, what are you going to do? Take us all to jail? Go ahead. Stop asking for permission. Stop asking government officials 
Stop politely asking them to stop abusing your kids. All right, um, let's uh, move on. This is from Yahoo. It says, NBC is facing a cataclysmic loss of audience for the 2022 Winter Olympics as viewership tanked for Friday's opening ceremony, averaging just 16 million. What a shame. It's a record low for the opening ceremony and a whopping 43% below the 2018 games in South Korea that notched 28.3 million viewers, despite also dealing with a less than advantageous Asian time zone for American audiences. Um, and uh, and there's a lot of speculation about why this is happening. Um, Yahoo continues, says, the host country, China, is a serious problem. Numerous countries, including the United States, are staging a diplomatic boycott of these games due to what they say is China's active campaign of genocide against the Uyghurs, a minority ethnic, uh, ethnic group uh, of mostly Muslims in the far northwest part of the country. Yeah, we're, there's, a, there's a diplomatic boycott, yet we're still per- participating in the games. And so most people are assuming that because of China's genocide and their human rights violations, that's why people aren't interested in the games. And that's the thing people are focusing on. Is like, why, why are we participating in the games? Why are we allowing this to happen? Why are all the countries in the world coming together to participate in games under the communist Chinese, Chinese regime, which is guilty of genocide and all the rest of it? Um, I, I personally think that that kind of misses at least half of the point. But we'll get to that in a second. ESPN has been discussing this issue, and uh, that discussion has gone maybe as you would as you would expect. Here, here the, here's a around the horn, the show around the horn, and uh, the host is talking about this and like how do you how do you justify this? I mean, how do you justify having the Olympics in China and participating in it and covering it, given the human rights violations? And here's how one of these sports analysts responds to that: with genocide and human rights violations in the Tibet region and against Uyghurs in China. The International Olympic Committee chose Beijing while stating it is committed to human rights. Today's opening ceremony, which again you will see tonight, featured a lighting of the torch by two members of the Chinese Olympic team, one of which is Uyghur. J.A. Adani, as a fan and then as a reporter, how do you reconcile and join this competition while also considering everything I just said? I think it's standard in sports right now. You have to have a cognitive dissonance. You need to compartmentalize. We've never had a more enjoyable NFL playoffs in this country, and we've never had more people watching the playoffs, and yet it goes on amid the ongoing allegations against Dan Snyder, owner of the Washington football team, and the, you know, the continuous concussion concerns, and now the concerns about diversity and the allegations and the questions about competitive integrity even, all of that, and yet we're still enjoying the games. And who are we to criticize China's human rights records when we have ongoing uh, attacks by the agents of the state against unarmed citizens and we've got assaults on the voting rights of, of our people of color in various states in this country? So sports, I think it is possible and it's necessary more than ever to just shut everything out if you are to enjoy the actual games themselves. So pathetic. These people are are so totally pathetic. I, there's there's no um, there's no group perhaps more more pitiful as we've seen in recent years than the sports analysts, and that becomes very clear whenever they get into discussing social cultural issues, bigger issues than sports themselves. Which is why I like most people prefer them just to, just to stick with the sports, obviously, but they don't want to stick with the sports because they want to. F- feel like their job is more important than that, so they chime in on these issues. And this is what we get, that genocide is comparable to um, legislation, uh, to, 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 to uh, you know, voter ID legislation. Requiring someone, this is what he just said, telling someone that they have to produce a license in order to vote is equal to genocide. That's what we just heard from a guy on the SBN. And in spite of the fact, I mean, that would already be an absurd comparison on its own. But then in spite of the fact that that same guy, I guarantee you, supports vaccine mandates, um, which require you to produce a vaccine card and a license to do anything in society. If you live in one of these cities where these uh, policies are in place. So, uh, and that's perfectly fine. You want to eat, you want to do anything. You got to produce a, a license and a vaccine card. But if you, have to, if you have to produce just one of those pieces of documentation, 
to vote, now it's genocide. And this is all leaving aside the fact that, um, for me, the, even the, the, the greater point, as significant as the human rights abuses are, the greater point as far as the Olympics go, and the fact that the whole world is participating, is that China, by, by all accounts now, um, engineered a virus which was then unleashed on the world somehow and proceeded to kill 5 million people all across the globe. We've all been living with that for two years. So China unleashes between the, uh, the last Olympic Games and this one. They engineer a deadly virus, unleash it on the globe and kill 5 million people. And, and then they say, hey guys, you want to come over and play some games? And, and all the countries in the world are like, yeah, let's go play. Sounds fun. And somehow that doesn't even make it into discussion. All right, let's uh, go to this. This is from the Daily Wire. I'm trying to find some news story that's not going to cause me to go off on a 15-minute rant, but I really can't find one. And this one's not going to be any better. This is from the Daily Wire. It says, on Thursday, 16 members of the Penn's, uh, Penn State uh, or University of Pennsylvania women's swimming team sent a letter to the University of Pennsylvania and the Ivy League asking them to refrain from suing the NCAA over its new athletic inclusion policies that would bar Leah Thomas, formerly known as Will Thomas, from participating in the NCAA championships in March. Um, they stated, we have been told that if we spoke out against her inclusion into women's competitions, that we would be removed from the team or that we would never get a job offer. Um, in the letter, the swimmers note, biologically, Leah holds an unfair advantage over competition in the women's category, as evidenced by her rankings that have bounced from number 462 as a male to number one as a female. I didn't even know it was that. It was quite that dramatic. Number 462 rank as a male, number one as a female. My God. Not a surprise, but still, when you see it on paper, it really sends the point home, doesn't it? Um, and continuing, if she were to be eligible to compete against us, we uh, she could now break Penn, Ivy, and NCAA women's swimming records, feats she could never have done as a male. Uh, and then they can continue, uh, it goes on for a while. We fully support Leah Thomas in her decision to affirm her gender identity and to transition from a man to a woman. Leah has every right to live her life authentically. However, we also recognize that when it comes to sports competitions, that the biology of sex is a separate issue from someone's gender identity. Biologically, Leah holds an unfair advantage over competition in the women's category. So on and so forth. Okay, so you see the problem here. And um, I, I don't mean to continue to victim blame here, but I am going to victim blame a little bit. Um. You're writing a letter in protest of this insanity, and that's okay, that's good. And you're speaking out, that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, University of Pennsylvania, they want to, they're talking about filing a lawsuit against the NCAA to make sure that this male is able to compete against females. The women, the, the girls on the team don't want that, and so they're writing the letter and they're protesting, and all that is good. But you're using the word her in your letter. In the letter, which is meant to protest the inclusion of a man in your competition, you're referring to him as a woman. And even, of course, taking a moment to say, oh, we totally respect and affirm, we, 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 we respect and we have so much admiration and respect for her affirming her gender identity. Well, there goes the whole case. You've just destroyed your whole case. It's out the window now. Because the only argument against, quote unquote, Leah Thomas competing against the women is that he is not a woman. That's the only argument. It's not simply biological advantages. That's, that's not the point. Because if you're going to affirm him as a woman and say, oh, but, uh, but she has biological advantages... Then the response is, well, okay, but what about, there, there are plenty of women who are just naturally more gifted as athletes, naturally stronger. They have a better build uh, for swimming and all that sort of thing. So, are, so you're saying women who have those kinds of biological advantages aren't allowed to compete? Oh, that doesn't make any sense. And it wouldn't. Because, of course, nobody would argue. I mean, there could be, a, there, there could be a someone, someone who's just the perfect specimen of an athlete. They have the perfect build for, for a swimmer. 
all kinds of biological advantages that, that other uh, women don't have. But if she's an actual woman, of course she should be able to compete. So the only argument is that he is a he. That's it. If you're affirming him as a woman while uh, protesting his inclusion in female sports, your argument is incoherent. You've cut yourself off at the kneecaps at that point. Either he's a woman or he's not. If he's a woman, then he belongs in the women's competition. If he's not, then he doesn't. This is the, the needle that um, so often people who are on the right side of this issue try to, th- try to thread. Because even people who are on the right side of the issue and see it for the insanity that it is, they're still too afraid to actually criticize trans ideology itself. And I'm here to tell you, you, you that you can't do that. You have to choose. Either you're going to submit yourself to trans ideology, give up on women's sports, give up on, on science and common sense, and that's it, or not. But if you choose not, then yes, you are going after trans ideology itself. You are saying that when someone who is a man claims to be a woman, they're wrong. You are saying that transgenderism is is an incoherent concept. That's what you're saying. And if you're not saying that, then there's no point in writing the letter. You got to choose a side. All right, um, let's do one more. Okay, let's we'll lighten the mood a little bit here. This is always fun. Something a little bit uh, a little bit more enjoyable, which is Brian Stelter on um, on CNN. You know, Jeff Zucker, CNN boss, he stepped down last week, involved in another another sex scandal. And there are a lot of uh, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time reading into the story. It doesn't matter that much. There are a lot of details that don't seem to make a, make much sense. I think I suspect there's more to it than that he was involved in some kind of consensual sexual relationship. Uh, with another executive. There's probably more going on, but whatever's going on there, it's it's sex related. And it seems like at CNN, everybody's having sex with everybody else except Brian Stelter. He's the only one getting left out. And um, I think that especially is making him pretty upset. And so here he is on CNN. We'll play a little bit of this. Uh, practically on the verge of tears, mourning the loss of Jeff Zucker, but also wanting to let the world know that we need CNN, that CNN is very important. Let's listen to some of this. I want to end the hour with a final thought, and I'm going to go a little bit uh, rogue here, so bear with me, okay? Jeff Zucker's departure was shocking to the staff of CNN, but CNN was not built by just one man, not by only Ted Turner, and it was not led only by Jeff Zucker. CNN is so much bigger than any single individual. It is about teams and teams of people, thousands of individuals who make up CNN. This place is not perfect. It will never be perfect. We will always have flaws. We will always screw up. We will always have to run corrections. We will always have to keep working to make it better and better and better every single day. That is the goal. But the people who say we're lacking journalism, that we've become an all talk channel, that we've run off and we're all opinions all the time, that Jeff Zucker led us astray, Those people aren't watching CNN. Well, because nobody is. They're not watching CNN. They're watching complaints about CNN on other channels. Because nobody's watching it. That's the truth. Let's put the map up on screen of bureaus around the world. CNN has more bureaus around the world than almost any other news organization on the planet. You know, those are all the international airports are. That map covers the world. London and Moscow. Those are all the airport terminals. And Nairobi and all the rest. That's why one of the network slogans is go there. On the day Jeff Zucker resigned, CNN aired more than 135. Go there. That's, a, that's not a very good slogan. Look, okay. All right, shut up. Uh, <laughs> go, go there. I mean, yeah, some of the people at CNN, they really go there. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Tubin masturbating during work meetings. They're, they're really going there in a lot of ways. Uh, I just, I, I love that. These people, they don't, they have people criticizing CNN. They don't watch it. Yeah, no, no one's watching it. I understand that they have bureaus and they're all, yeah, because it's on in the airport. And that's where people watch it. No one else is watching it. He goes on for a while there because he really sees this. He's like, he he thinks that this is important to people. He thinks that, he thinks that 
average Americans sitting at home. First of all, he, he believes that they're watching his show, which none of them are. But then he also believes that they're concerned that Jeff Zucker is no longer the CEO of, uh, of CNN. But CNN, they're going to they're gonna keep at it. And they're going to keep having sex with each other with reckless abandon, except for Brian Stelter. And that really is the greatest tragedy. Let's get now to the uh, comment section. Daily cancellations are the law. All right, dailywire.com slash sweet baby comments is where you can leave a video comment. We got a bunch of video comments while we were gone. We'll play uh, just a couple of let's I want to start with um with clip uh, twelve though. Let's start here with twelve. Howdy, Mr. Walsh. My name is Caleb and I'm the president of the Texas AM chapter of Young Americans for Freedom. Uh, our pronouns are gig slash them. Uh, and we are super excited to have you here on campus Wednesday. Uh, February 9th, 7 p.m., Bethancourt Ballroom. Tickets are free at tamuyaf.org. Um, but yeah, we're super excited that you're here. And I think uh, all of us here believe that uh, all of your sweet babies in College Station should be mandated to be at this event uh, by penalty of death. Uh, as the as theocratic fascist dictator and cult leader, uh, we think that you have the power to do that. And it would only be just, or if you think, maybe even a worse punishment to be banned from the show. Uh, that's just what we think. We're super stoked that you're coming out. Thanks and gig em. Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a good a good opportunity to promote the fact that I will be speaking at Texas A&M on Wednesday. And uh, I mean, that's their suggestion that anyone on campus who refuses to come, penalty of death. I mean, that's, that's something we could think. I, I'd, I'd have to talk to the, um, you know, the security there and the local police to see if we can organize something like that. I'm not sure if they're going to go along with it, but I'll be there uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Wednesday. So I hope you guys will will. Uh, will show up. I kind of expect, I don't know, Texas A&M, it's, it's more conservative even than most Christian universities, which says a lot more about Christian universities than anything else. And the last Christian university I went to, of course, there was a mobs of leftists screaming in the street in horror. I don't expect that kind of reaction at Texas A&M, but then again, you never know. So we'll see. All right, let's go to uh, clip nine. Sweet Daddy Walsh, just want to say, hope you're doing something important on these days off, my brother. Because you forced me to listen to Knowles. It's almost unforgivable. You might ban me from the show for this. But I never listen to Knowles, man. And I and I know I just said never to apologize, but that is one thing that I will I will say. I'm deeply sorry for that. We have one more clip. This is an, I love these because these are always inspiring. Let's play clip 10. Who makes Twitter mobs fly off the handle with rage? Hey, who's to blame? It's a sweet baby gang. Good. So, returning the shopping cart and singing the sweet baby gang anthem at the same time. We, I have I have people all across the country now re- filming themselves recording, rec- recording as they return shopping carts, and I it might be very confusing for the other people in the parking lot, but it's a movement that we've started. Um, all right, let's go to some of the written comments. This is Seymour. Now, these are kind of random comments from some of the videos we posted and some of the, maybe the, you know, I've had to pull from various places because we didn't have a show last week. But Seymour Fields says, Matt Walsh really just told guys to buy their girlfriends and wives cleaning supplies for Valentine's Day. And I promptly fell out of my chair laughing at work. Well, I think it's a good recommendation because, uh, you know, I've been married for 10 years, as you know, and uh, I've learned quite a lot about women and how they work. And when it comes to gifts, what what they care most about is, is it practical? Can I use it? That's why women, they don't want diamonds and jewelry and all this kind of stuff. You can't use that. They want things they can use. Cleaning supplies. From naturally, it's clean. Jay Bling says, Matt is one of the very few popular YouTuber commentators who doesn't fall into the preferred pronoun fantasy. I respect him immensely for that. Well, I appreciate that, but um, it's kind of sad. <laughs> that that's something you have to respect me for is because I'm just going to call a man a man and a woman a woman. Um, it sh- that's not something that should require any kind of courage or anything like that. Um, ML34 says, Matt, I saw your tweets about 1883. I think you're being unfair. It's a pretty good show. Yeah, I did kind of, I, I went off on, on, on that last night. This is, this is one of the struggles I have in my marriage with, with my wife is that I'm always trying to enlighten her with important commentary before, during, and after the shows and movies that we watch together. And uh, she has no appreciation for that whatsoever. And that's why I end up putting most of this stuff on Twitter because I, I try to give these lectures to my wife 
um, while we're watching these shows. And she's, she's just not a receptive audience at all. So we're watching the show 1883 yesterday on Paramount+. Plus, and um, it's, a, it's a Western about a group of settlers who are traveling across the country from Texas to Oregon. And it's set in the year 1883, as you might expect. And I think I mentioned it on the show before because I recommended it. Because it started as a kind of gritty, classic, old-fashioned Western. And uh, I, I liked it. And I'm, and I'm thinking, it's, it's been so long since... It's pretty rare that we get a good Western from Hollywood, especially a, a, a television show. I mean, the last good one was, I don't know, Lonesome Dove. I'm highly, highly critical of modern Westerns because they're so often botched. And to such an absurd degree that it's offensive. It offends me. But this show starts well. It stars Sam Elliott, um, it, which is great casting. And, uh, and it's a good show. And then about three or four episodes in, it turns into this soap opera where the main character and the main focus is this teenage girl and her love life. And of course, at the same time, she's, a, she's this tough-as-nails tough cowgirl. And all the women in the show, of course, are tough gunslingers. All of them. And the whole show starts to focus around these women. I mean, you've got Sam Elliott in a Western where they're going across the, the, old, the old West. And, okay, I know what we're going to do. We're going to focus it on the teenage girl and her love life. And then the latest episode was the last straw for me because the caravan, they make its way, uh, it makes its way into Comanche country. And this is when the show should really turn on, right? Because keep in mind that the Comanches were ruthless warriors. They were the most dangerous and violent Indian tribe in the country. Um, and uh, this is where we should be getting in the show a whole bunch of, of awesome, intense battles between cowboys and Indians, and it should be great. But instead, the group meets up with some Comanches. And they're all friendly and kind and wise. And they speak perfect English. And they end up being like the, the, the superhero guardians for the group. And they're kind of following the group from a distance. And every time the group gets into a bind, they swoop in to save them. Yeah, because that's what the Comanches would have done in 1883 in the Old West. That's, yeah, sure. That's the, anytime they saw a group of white settlers, what, they all said to themselves, hey, let's make, sure, let's make sure we can usher them. Let's risk our lives to make sure that they can uh, make it across the Great Plains unscathed. And then the ultimate jump the shark moment was when there was, a, there was a tornado coming. And so once again, the Comanches swoop in to save the, uh, the hapless white people. And, uh, and, and, and while the tornado is going over top these people, the Comanche and the teenage girl start making out while there's a tornado. And her hat doesn't even fly off. And then when all is said and done and the caravan's destroyed and wagons are destroyed and all their supplies are gone and everything, and they're probably going to die. And the, the, the father goes up to the teenage girl and says, oh, you know, did you, how did you do? Are you okay? And she says, it was beautiful, daddy. It was beautiful. The tornado was beautiful. It just said, we're all going to die now, but it was beautiful because you made out with the Indian during it. My God. Anyway. I, I was trying to explain all this while we were watching the show last night with my wife, and uh, she did not want to hear it any more than probably anyone right now wants to hear it either. Well, as you all know, I am a theocratic fascist and a beloved LGBTQ children's book author. And as a man who bears this uh, extremely valid and important title, I'm always looking for new ways to expand my influence across a nation that's deep in need of spiritual guidance and also to, uh, to profit as well. It's another thing I'm worried about. So I ask you, the loyal followers of my regime, to, uh, to show your dedication by wearing it on your sleeve, literally. So from this point forward, I will be releasing a very limited edition patch once a month for you to wear because it's an utmost importance that uh, values such as saving abuelas, returning grocery carts, spreading anti-panda sentiment. It's, it's very important to share this with the public. So these are patches that you can wear. I think you put them on your uh, like a shirt sleeve. You could iron them directly onto your skin, and I can't officially recommend that, but I will say that that's the, the, the most dedicated person. That's what they would do. The future of this nation depends on you. Inspire your friends and family to return their grocery carts and question the existence of pandas at the same time. My followers will also receive a digital version of the patch for their online Daily Wire profile. Remember, stock up on these patches. Uh, the stock will be very limited, so make sure you, you go pick up the first release of patches right now because we all know this world needs it. Go to dailywire.com shop. And uh, get your first patch today. Also a great Valentine's Day card. Um, or a Valentine's Day gift as well. You can get a Valentine's for, for, your, for your wife. Get them a, a Matt Walsh Show patch. They're going to love that. Um, uh, also, speaking of Valentine's Day, we also have, uh, and there's no copy for this at all. Really? There's, 
riff, riff on how great they are. So the, the, our, our copy editor was taking the, the, the uh, week off. So uh, what I'm being told is to riff on how great they are. And it's, it's easy to riff on these Valentine's Day. Daily Wire, Daily Wire Valentine's Day cards, um, which are, I tell you what, they are great. The thing about these cards that jumps out at me when I look at them is I think they're great. These are just great cards. So you can get 12 of them for $9.99 by going where? I don't know because it doesn't say. Dailywire.com, I assume. You'll find it there. Finally, this Thursday, February 10th, will be the world premiere of Shut In, Daily Wire's first original film at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central over at Daily, Wire, uh, Daily Wire's YouTube. That means that everyone can watch, at least the premiere, you can watch it for free. The suspenseful thriller follows a young mother trapped by her violent ex and his meth-addicted friend, and she must escape to save her children before it's too late. It's a tale of redemption to the beat of a seat-gripping thriller. The film premieres this February, uh, this Thursday, February 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, over at the uh, Daily Wire YouTube channel. Make sure you click the link in the description and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss it, because after the premiere, it will be available only to Daily Wire members. We enter the entertainment space in order to send Hollywood a message that you no longer have a monopoly on the film industry, and the release of this film is just the next step in proving it. So make sure you tune in for that. Join me, Ben Shapiro, Jeremy Boring, Michael Knowles, and Andrew Clavin, Thursday night at 7.30 Eastern, 6 p.m., uh, 6.30 p.m. Central on Daily Wire's YouTube channel. The premiere of Shut In starts at 9 p.m. Eastern on the same channel, so make sure to tune in before then. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Now, the other story that was at the top of the headlines while I was journeying across the uh, third world was that of the NFL head coach who claims that he's being oppressed and persecuted by the league, which has made him a millionaire. As you may have heard, Brian Flores, a black man, was fired by the Miami Dolphins after the team underperformed and missed the playoffs. Now, the NFL is notorious for firing head coaches at the drop of a hat. If you have one bad season, you're going to be out on your butt. You may even be fired after a good season. The most infamous such example is Marty Schottenheimer back, I think it was 2006, 2007. He was fired by the Chargers after a 14-2 season. Jim Harbaugh was run out of town by the 49ers after winning 44 games in three seasons and taking his team to the Super Bowl. And both of those coaches, by the way, are white. So this rule applies to white and black coaches alike. You have to win. You have to win a lot. You have to win now. You have to win playoff games or you get canned. Because the only thing that the NFL cares about is winning. That's all that matters. Now, not all teams are very good at achieving that objective, but that is the objective nonetheless. So Flores, he got fired, um, like many Miami Dolphins coaches before him, and he could have taken his lumps and quickly gotten a new job, either as a head coach or a coordinator with a new team. Instead, he chose to file a lawsuit claiming that he's the victim of racism. He says that systemic racism in the NFL prevents black men like himself from becoming coaches, even though he is a coach and has been and has held a coaching job in the, in the league for years. Notably, the text of his lawsuit, which reads like a compilation of tweets from accounts with BLM slogans in their profiles, doesn't offer any evidence of racism. Instead, it makes a series of unsubstantiated and sometimes quite wild allegations, allegations which, if true, still wouldn't amount to racism. Flores also accuses the New York Giants of bringing, him, uh, of bringing him in for an interview just because he's a minority, even though they had already determined to hire somebody else. I don't know if that's true or not, but, but it might be. And the reason that it might be is that is because the Giants would have been following the very affirmative action policies that were meant to alleviate the mythical racism against black coaching candidates that Flores is complaining about. So the league has a policy called the Rooney Rule, which requires teams to interview minority candidates. Even if they already know they want to hire somebody else, they have to bring in a minority candidate for an interview. That's the rule. The Giants followed that rule, and for their trouble, they're now being sued for bigotry. Bigotry against black coaches because of a rule that was put in place for their sake. The NFL has defended itself meekly, assuring the public that it's not engaging in any conspiracy to prevent black people from becoming coaches. And yet, while defending itself, Commissioner Roger Goodell uh, still issued a memo stating, quote, we will reevaluate and examine all policies, guidelines, and initiatives relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including as they relate to gender. We are retaining outside experts to assist in this review, and will also solicit input from current and former players and coaches, advocates, and other authorities in this area. Our goal is simple. Make our efforts and those of the clubs more effective so that real and tangible results will be achieved. 
Translation. We aren't racist, but if you think we're racist, then yes, we're totally racist. Because it would be racist to tell you that you're wrong about us being racist. Brian Flores, meanwhile, is uh, doing the media tour, trying to make his case. Here he is with Don Lemon. I believe that the, the, the system is broken in, in the National Football League in regards to uh, hiring minorities and black coaches, uh, head coaches, and people in uh, positions of power, uh, GM, head coach. Uh, and I'm doing it um, because I think about my, 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 my two boys and my daughter. Um, and there's, there just simply isn't enough representation um, of people who look like them um, in head coaching roles, in general manager roles, in executive and president roles in the National Football League. Uh, and I want them to be able to uh, uh, look at those roles. I want them to be able to, to, to look and, and, and believe that they can, they can get into a role like that. And that's simply not the case right now. Inspiring. Inspiring. P- poor guy, too. I mean, multimillionaire coach in the NFL. Nobody has suffered as much as him except Colin Kaepernick and, you know, the employees of Spotify. Those are really the, the, the groups in, in America, in the world, that have suffered the most. Now, yeah, he's rich and prominent and powerful, but he could be even more rich and prominent and powerful if not for all the racism. You know, he, he, so, so this is a guy sitting there saying, yeah, I've got, uh, you know, $10 million, uh, b- but I could have $20 million if not for all this racism. Notice how he says the system is broken with regards to hiring black coaches, but then quickly qualifies by saying head coaches. Why? Well, because, in fact, there are tons of black coaches, tons of black coordinators, tons of black players and staff at all levels. Black people are massively overrepresented in the NFL in comparison to population size at almost every position and every level on every team. Black people make up 13% of the population, yet nearly 60% of the athletes in the league. But there are a few areas where that's not the case, which can only be the product of racism, he says. I wonder, though, if the system is broken in regards to hiring black head coaches, what about the system in regards to hiring white cornerbacks? There are currently zero of those in the entire league. There are also very few white running backs, very few white wide receivers, a few, but not many. Very few white safeties, white linebackers. The vast majority of the highest paid stars in the league at at most positions are not white. Is that a sign of anti-white bias? Well, no, of course not. Because underrepresentation of whites is never racism, while underrepresentation of blacks is always racism. So you see how that works. There's no evidence or reason to believe that any black man has ever been turned down for a coaching job because of his race. The claim is preposterous on its face, though that might change. Thanks to the Kaepernick, uh, the Kaepernick wing of the NFL, uh, here's what I will say. And Media Matters are going to have a lot of fun with this. If I were an NFL owner right now, I might at this point actually hesitate to hire any coach who is not a straight white male. If I'm running an NFL organization in the year 2022, I would prefer to hire a straight white male. Why? Because a straight white male is the only kind of coach I can fire without being sued. Flores and his ilk pretend that they're helping more black people get hired, but the opposite is the case. Whereas before, race may not have factored into the equation, now owners have to think when evaluating a black candidate, they have to think, well, you know, if this guy leads us to a 3-14 and season, I probably can't fire him without Al Sharpton holding a press conference outside the stadium. But if I hire the white guy, I can fire him after a 14-3 and season, and nobody will care. Flores doesn't care about that, though, because this is all about him. Being an NFL coach was profitable, but being a victim is even more profitable. It used to be something of a joke to call somebody a professional victim. Now that's a literal occupation available to certain demographics. They even offer college degrees in the field. Why do something for money when you can sit around crying and make more money and earn greater adulation for it? That's the calculation Flores has made. You can hardly blame him from a financial perspective. I mean, it makes sense. But from a moral perspective and the perspective of self-respect and dignity, which Flores has chosen to forfeit, we can certainly say to him, you, sir, are canceled. And that'll do it for us today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodowski. 
The show is edited by Robbie Dantzler. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Daughter, she's very pretty. <laughs>